Yes, ma'am. Sujata, ma'am, uh, just give stop presenting. You are presenting your screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Once again, you are uh, looking at my face. I think after four days. And then uh, nice to meet you all. And regarding my feedback, uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Maidili for having given me this great opportunity. And to be frank, uh, I have never done any online presentation so far. It was a tough task for me, even after uh, putting in so many years of uh, uh, experience in teaching. We are always used to look at the audience in front of us. Uh, and uh, we teachers are very good at uh, judging how they are uh, listening to us or not listening or anything. Anything uh, can be like uh, judged. But this is totally a new platform. And I never ventured this because uh, I didn't have any kind of faith in this. Because if you can't see anybody in front of you, it's like uh, speaking to the air. So like speaking to a ghost, I must say, to be frank. But uh, uh, Dr. Maitri had made it uh, wonderfully like uh, a different thing. So when she was giving me a kind of practice, to, to be frank. She was uh, giving a trial how to speak. And when you open the screen, like uh, very horribly, our face is appearing. That is like really horrible to look at our face and speaking, like speaking to a mirror. So I was totally scared. I have never uh, experienced this in my life. I can just control the whole crowd, audience, uh, the classroom. Everything is OK. But looking at our face is very tough. That's how translation is. We always like think uh, it's a very uh, easy or something like that. But when it comes to a kind of practical application, it's very tough. And uh, Dr. Maitri had done it wonderfully. And I thank the college, Vasily College, for uh, giving this opportunity to her. And she's such a wonderful person, person with patience, a lot of patience. And uh, she has given training to all. She kept on working. And uh, I think uh, many are looking at the minus points of this kind of online seminars. Like uh, uh, you're not able to see the viewer or Sometimes you have to mute. All these things we have to keep in control. Like how we keep our class in control. As the teachers of uh, English language, we have to keep our students in control. I mean, they want to go away and they want to talk something, murmur. I never like such things in my class. If they want to talk, let them talk. If I have to talk, they have to listen to me. It's like uh, so maybe it's like it sounds very uh, dictated like but still this is a very uh, different thing that's what i want to tell you and uh, she has succeeded in that i must say and regarding this translation workshop uh, i could uh, uh, have the privilege of listening to great speakers like maniam sir and Shanti chitra ma'am and uh, susila ma'am susila ma'am is great she's a star what i really wanted to meet her once because she belongs to Tamil literature and she's speaking good English. That's a great thing. And so she's a role model to us. And today's speaker also. So it's a great platform. And uh, my dear participants, uh, you might be a lecturer, a professor, or a research scholar, or a student. I just place an humble request that uh, don't leave it as it is. Okay? I have seen many webinars. They simply talk on some subject and they go off. But we have to do something fruitful to our society. So I place a request to Dr. Maithili, Madam, that if possible, if that's a possibility, because again, the burden will be on Maithili, Madam. So we can compile a book uh, of assignments, like uh, you can take a short story from your mother tongue, and you can try to translate, maybe from Bengali or from Odia or from Kerala or from any other uh, state, you can take a kind of like a, a small short story of two pages. You can take try, try to translate into English whoever is interested and we can <clears throat> take that and we can compile it and we can even publish a book if possible and that will be a credit to all of us whoever is doing it will be a credit to you this is a suggestion only because uh, it's very easy nowadays in those days in our days publishing a book was a Herculean task but now it's possible so it's going to be a contribution so this is a suggestion and with these few words I wish you all best of luck and uh, I would like to meet you more often. You can very well try to contact me. My mail ID is there. If anybody needs my PowerPoint, I would like to give you. And uh, I'm really happy to be a part of this seven days international conference. Thank you, Maidili. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, Kadambari ma'am is there on the
line and uh, sujata sundar ma'am you are just presenting your screen to everyone could you please give stop presenting from your mobile i again repeat sujata sundar ma'am you are presenting your screen to everyone just give the option stop presenting in your mobile right so it's time for us uh, to welcome today's guest actually and i just express my excuse to sir for making him wait for the last 10 minutes and i would like to give a uh, introduction about sir actually his when i asked for this uh, bio data uh, to have a short introduction about him i was amazed seeing his short introduction because it was not short it was very short which ran up to 25 pages so i was amazed with sachin c ketkar sir he is here he is a bilingual writer at large a translator editor blogger researcher based in baroda gujarat he holds a doctorate from vn south gujarat university surat he claims 22 years of rich teaching experience currently working as professor of english faculty of arts in maharaja sajirao university of baroda he also coordinates uh, a coordinator of the department of research project under ugc sap drs2 indian literatures and cultures with emphasis on marathi and gujarati literatures and cultures being his primary area of research he has translated early century and contemporary poetry from marathi and gujarati and also poems from english to marathi as a feather added to this cap literary journal sanity academy new delhi awarded him indian literary poetry translation prize in the year 2000 he has published nearly 60 articles interviews and book reviews he has 24 citations two of them were h index and one in i can index his area of specialization or marathi literature comparative literature indian literature translation studies etc he has published a novel several poems and translated huge number of poems he is the editor and reviewer of many journals his academic achievement data runs up to 25 pages which shows overwhelming interest and his consciousness towards literature and translation and it is my pleasure to have such a eminent and versatile personality administers to deliver this lecture on translation studies and world literature i would like to hand over the session to dr sachin k said ketka sir c ketka sir sir the floor is yours you can take up sir good morning all of you good morning uh, dr maithili uh, am i audi am i audible can you see yes. yes sir you are audible sir yeah yeah uh, i want to begin by thanking uh, dr maithili uh, for having me in this such a uh, important event of translation workshop that you have organized so i also want to congratulate you for mm -hmm. organizing this excellent uh, workshop mm -hmm. uh, uh, and i am also want to thank you for that generous introduction and uh, i am very happy to be with all of you with all the uh, distinguished academicians in the south uh, i have interacted mostly my area of research has been with gujarati and marathi and uh, it's my pleasure to share whatever i have done my research with you uh, so without uh, much ado i think i will go straight over to uh, my presentation the topic of my presentation today is from comparative from translation studies to world literature the idea of world literature has been an emergent idea in past couple of decades uh, and translation studies also seems to have taken great strides after 90s so what i am trying to do is i am trying to explore the common ground before between the two important uh, disciplinary formations and uh, for that i would like to share my uh, slides with all of you
yeah uh, can you see the slide sir just a minute sir yes sir you are presenting sir yeah so thanks and i, I would like to begin right away and what i am trying to uh, look at is how translation studies can be thought of as world literature and how world literature can be thought of as translation studies uh the objective of this presentation is to develop this argument that the certain conceptual methodological form formulations developed by the theorists of world literature after 1990s like david damrosch pascal casnova uh frank frank moretti among others display continuities with the development of in translation studies especially the very de redefinition of idea of translation and methodologies for studying translation so this is an overarching argument that i am making but through through this argument what i want to do is i want to introduce students and researchers to recent development and debates in translation studies and world literature uh and also explore common ground and differences between the two disciplines so there is an overarching argument which i am trying to make and inside of this overarching argument i am to uh, i am trying to introduce many of uh, researchers who may be at the beginners level in this workshop there may be very advanced researchers also but i am also i am trying to maybe engage with both of them but primarily i am trying to introduce uh, uh, the researchers who have started looking into the question of translation and comparative literature and how do i plan to go about it is in this this way this is the outline of my presentation uh, i am going to begin by talking about two contemporary translations of world literature i am going to take two texts so in spite of the fact that the most of my presentation will be theoretically inclined i want to ground myself into important solid text uh, so that it will help uh, uh, the audience to grasp the arguments that i am trying to make then i will try to point out how the conventional views of translation which are pervasive in our country do not all researchers take that there are researchers who avoid this kind of conventional views of translation uh, uh, are in inadequate to understand the significance of this jaldi pati jo je jaldi jaldi nava bolar beta uh from yes, traditional sir. from traditional conventional translation studies i will then go over to what is known as contemporary translation studies after i point out the inadequacies of conventional translation studies and then also take a look at traditional views of world literature and uh, to contemporary approaches in world literature that came into forefront after the 90s and explore the relation between translation and world literature so that is how my presentation will flow today yeah so let us begin by taking a look at the first text that i want to look at the first text is a translation of a very well known book called uh, unto this last by mohan das karamchand gandhi who needs no introduction obviously uh in 1904 sometime between 8 to 25 june while traveling from johannesburg to durban Gandhi read a book called Unto This Last, which was written in 1860 by the leading British art critic and thinker John Ruskin. And what does Gandhi say about this book when he first read it? He says, "I could not get any sleep that night. I determined to change my life in accordance to the ideals of this book." in his famous autobiography in a chapter titled the magic book of spell of a book gandhi says that this was the book that brought about an instantaneous and practical transformation in my life so people who are aware of gandhi's biography know how he was treated by traveling to in uh, to durban uh, to johannesburg and how he was thrown out of the uh, coach but what people do not emphasize sufficiently is impact made by certain books on gandhi and this is one of the important books that led a lasting impression on gandhi's mind and it transformed his life he summarized the whole book in three points 
that the good of the individual is contained in the good of all that a lawyer's work has the same value as the barber's in as much as all have the same right to earning their livelihood from their work and the third point that he made was that a life of labor the life of tiller of the soil and a handicraftsman is the life worth living then he went on to summarize the whole book in into gujarati he translated it very uh, freely and gave it a title called sarvodaya that is welfare of all and it was published in nine installments in indian opinion uh, during may to july 1908 which is almost uh, 112 years ago then the book was retranslated back into english now this is very interesting by walji govind desai in 1956 in which govind ji desai says walji govind ji desai says raskin's words are being retained as far as possible this circulation of text from english to gujarati and from gujarati back into english and its profound impact on freedom struggle through translation reveals translation as the key mechanism of world literature so this is our first book and uh, uh, i i need not tell you much about unto this last because many of you would be teachers of english and you may have heard of this book some of you may also have taught this book as i did at one point point of time unto this last is a very sharp critique of lyse's fair that is the whole liberal economical thought that says that the free hand of market that market is a kind of self regulatory mechanism which should not be governed by the state so the whole uh, philosophy of liberal capitalist uh, economy that was developed by people like adam smith came under sharp critique from john ruskin and ruskin followed something called christian socialism so he is using metaphors from the bible uh, so the title of his book unto this last actually is a phrase taken from bible which says that uh, even the last person in the row uh, will get the same wages as the first person who enters the wine yard so that's a very famous uh, parable in bible which uh, uh, john ruskin is using now this whole idea is transformed into gujarati and it's called sarvodaya and sarvodaya is welfare of all so one question that would come to our mind from a very conventional approach to translation studies would be is sarvodaya a good translation of unto this last or is it accurate translation or does gandhi capture the spirit of the original or does gandhi remain faithful to the original these are some of the questions that we continuously ask in the older paradigm of translation studies and i'm sure you must have heard of these ideas you must have some of you also must have discussed these ideas but let's take a look at another text and it comes from the opposite end of political spectrum ideologically and the book is written the book is called 1857 te swatantra samar by a thinker and a freedom fighter called vinayak damodar savarkar from 1883 to 1966 he wrote a book in marathi and it was translated into english as indian war of independence in 1857 indian 1857 uh, during his stay in london as a student of law in which he countered the colonial interpretation of mutiny from a revolutionary nationalist perspective interestingly some years uh, uh, probably in the same year or so savarkar may have met gandhi in india house where he used to stay so gandhi visited this india house it was uh, it was a place uh, made by a very famous gujarati freedom fighter called shamji krishna verma and in this place they are probably have met but we don't know uh, with uh, clarity whether they actually met and interacted but uh, savarkar used to stay in this place and this is the place where he also uh, formed secret revolutionary societies when he wrote this book in marathi it uh, he wanted to publish it from maharashtra so secretly he sent this book to maharashtra but british secret service got a whiff of this 
and they raided the press and this book was actually banned before it was it even was, went to the press in maharashtra so the book had to be secretly sent back to london where savarkar used to live uh, so there was no way by which he could publish this book in marathi which is very interesting so the whole group of revolutionaries wanted to publish it in paris because uh, france and germany were not under british colonial rule so they wanted to publish it later at germany where they thought they would have devnagari fonts because germany had a very flourishing uh, academic orientation towards orientalism and indology as we are aware and uh, savarkar and the revolutionaries thought that probably they would publish it from germany however these governments did not want to offend the british so the marathi book could not be published the book was then later translated into english by the members of the revolutionary group called abhinav bharat started by savarkar and the people who translated it along with savarkar were koregaonkar padke kunte under supervision of uh, mr b b s ayer another revolutionary who was based there the english translation was then sent to holland and published from holland in 1907 the revolutionaries then spread rumor that book is being printed in france so the british government uh, stepped in and tried to get it banned but they realized that it was not being published in france while it was actually being published in holland revolutionaries then smuggled the book the translation into india by wrapping the book in the covers printed with bogus names such as the posthumous papers of pickwick club scots work don quixote the later editions of book were secretly brought out by freedom fighters like madame bikaji kama in france the famous gadar party in usa and also equally famous rash bihari bose and subhash chandra bose published this book in japan the book was officially published in india india in english and marathi only after 1947 so you can see that this is very fascinating history of a book that is written in marathi but because it cannot be published in marathi it had to be translated and uh, even after being translated it could not be published in many parts of the world so it had to be secretly published from holland and then it had to be smuggled in various ways what is fascinating about the story of this translation is that it had immense impact on revolutionary freedom struggle which promote which uh, put violence as one of their important uh, methods of freedom struggle so there is another book by gandhi which puts non violence at core of its politics while this is the book which promotes violence Uh, so you can see that there are two ways in which you can resist colonial empire, and both these uh, ways of resisting colonialism, British colonialism, involves translation either from English, like uh, Gandhi did, or into English, like Savarkar and his revolutionary friends did. So you are translating from the language of the colonizers to resist the politics and the colonial oppression. or you are translating it into english again to resist or to fight colonialism so what so what is the point that i am trying to make by uh, what is the point that i am trying to make by discussing these two translations the point that i am trying to make is if you ask very traditional questions about translation like is it a good translation did koregaonkar fadke kunte did a good work did it capture the spirit did it capture was was the translation faithful was it close enough or was it transcreation all these traditional questions of translation do not address some of the very important things that translation can do one of the things that translation can do is actually launch a freedom movement like sarvodaya and sarvodaya is a cornerstone of gandhian politics and it was translated into all indian languages so you can see that translation becomes one of the ways in which movements across the world 
are generated. So if you ask whether it is good translation, bad translation, whether equivalents are possible, whether Sarvoda is a good translation of unto this last, then such questions actually do not help us to understand the significance, the importance of this activity. And this importance of this activity is historical role played by this book. Is uh, James 1 translation of the Bible a good translation? For me, is irrelevant question, or even outdated question. Whether it uh, captures the spirit of it is not important. What is important is what is the role of this translated work in the cultural history of that place. And you can see that King James Bible influenced the later development of English literature profoundly. You cannot think of Milton or Shakespeare or even later writers who were deeply influenced by the English language used in this translated text. So the conventional paradigm of translation, and that is what I'm trying to argue, is clearly inadequate because it asks these kind of questions to us. Poetry is what is lost in translation. Translation is like a woman. If she is beautiful, she is not faithful. Or if she is faithful, she is not beautiful. Translation involves loss and it's always approximate. Tran never translate word for word or never translate literally. Translation should be faithful to the spirit rather than to letter of the original. This conventional thinking about translation is older than the Roman thinkers like Cicero or Horace. Now you can ask these questions to say, for example, if I ask the question, what is lost in Gandhi's uh, rewriting of Sarvodaya? Or what is lost in uh, Koregaokar's translation of Savarkar's book? Or is it faithful? Now all these questions to me sound absolutely useless questions when I sit down to study two seminal books like these. So contemporary translation studies has moved away from this traditional uh, conventional thinking about translation. It has because it's primarily dualistic, normative and hierarchic. It invariably compares the translation with the original and invariably sees translation as an inferior and secondary to the original. Now, if you see that the Savarkar's English translation was inferior to its Marathi, or if you say that uh, Gandhi's Sarvoda is inferior to, uh, to unto this last. Now, this is a ridiculous thing to say because uh, unto this last was not considered as important as Sarvoda is to Indian society and culture. The place that the text occupies in tra translating culture also changes with translation. Raskin's book is just one of the books in the history of English literature. While Gandhi's book is one of the leading theoretical, ideological text in the Gandhian politics of freedom struggle. The traditional views of translation sees translation from the point of view of the source text and a language and is primarily focused on practice of translating. The discipline of translation studies, however, which is different from thinking about translation that we have been discussing, which goes back to times of Cicero and Homer and uh, I'm sorry, Horace. This kind of thinking of translation is very old, but the discipline of translation studies only seems to emerge in the late 70s. It was only in 1978 that James Holmes proposed that the name of translation studies be adopted for the discipline that concerns itself with the problems raised by production and descriptions of translation. So towards the end of the 1970s, you find that there is a whole discipline called translation studies emerging. Before that, we, we look at translation as a kind of branch of applied linguistics. You may have looked at, uh, you may have thought of Catford, you may have discussed NIDA. Many people have thought about translation largely from applied linguistics perspective, but discipline of translation studies seems to emerge only in 1978 with James Holmes. So how is contemporary translation studies different from the traditional uh, translation studies? 
the theoretical and i think translation theory is a very recent development it's only 20th century development uh you may have heard of uh, walter benjamin and his remarkable theorization of translation you may be familiar with the translation theories of uh, roman jakobson i'm sure you must have discussed it in the workshop at some point with these developments you see that uh, translation is some could be thought of as something that can be theorized uh i am not i don't know whether in the course of this workshop whether you discussed uh, walter benjamin's very famous theory of translation as afterlife and his notion of pure language where he is arguing that translation is not secondary but it gives life to the text and uh, it gives afterlife to the text uh, benjamin also famously argues that translation is almost a superior activity than original creative writing and that is because it it actually takes the text out from its linguistic constraints and takes it into the universal language of man and he is referring to the fall of babel where the universal essential ur language of man was destroyed by god god's wrath when he scattered uh, all people across the earth after uh, the fall of babel i'm sure you must have heard of this story so walter benjamin argues that translation takes text into a superior domain so for him translation is a kind of almost superior activity to original that's a very powerful argument that he is developing and you can see that translation starts being theoretical in 20th century till then it was only practice based people used to ask questions from practice rather than as a theory what are the other questions that we ask in translate contemporary translation studies is the what is the role played by translation in literary history and cultural history for example the rewriting of uh, rama and by kamban or by tulsidas are not exact equivalents but their impact on the society is even greater than sanskrit rama and because how many people can read sanskrit rama and while when rama and enters the language of people through this rewritings and refractions it becomes a very powerful cultural force so what is the role played by translation in literary and cultural history what does the dominant ideological outlook of the society how does this affect translation activity why did gandhi select unto this last he is given by his own ideology and historical positioning here is a man who is trying to develop a philosophical framework for the anti colonial resistance and for him it's not merely anti colonial freedom struggle for gandhi is not merely anti british it is uh, anti western capitalism so you can see he is developing a large theoretical frame philosophical frame and in that philosophical frame books like unto this last played a very important role we also are interested in how does translation affect ideological currents of the society and very famous example would be the orientalist translation of uh, sanskrit works and very often orientalist translations would represent india and the east in a very stereotypical a historical way and in some ways that edward said has famously argued that this kind of translations were governed by colonial project so it's colon it justified colonialism in many ways so you can see that you cannot consider translation outside its ideology and politics you cannot think of translation as an isolated ha activity that happens only in your libraries or in your reading rooms contemporary translation studies often focuses on the function and it becomes functionalist very often like what is the function of bible translation in a particular culture we ask the question about role of translation in the target language and target culture and the role of target language and culture in the process of translation it often tends to be descriptive in its approach so you can see that translation studies has evolved out of the conventional thinking about translation into larger cultural frame 
into looking at translation from a larger historical cultural perspective rather than merely word as a verbal activity or a, as a practice and some of the important contemporary approaches to translation are the descriptive translation studies developed by Gideon Terry uh, rewriting or manipulation school associated with Andre Lefebvre and Theo Hermans and the policy steam approach developed with Itamar Evan Zuhar so these are uh, more recent, more uh, influential theorizations of translation. Uh, many contemporary approaches like post-colonial approach and cultural studies approach to translation see translation as an ideological activity involving politics of representation, which can only be understood in its social, cultural, historical context. It also seeks, seeks to critically rethink the histories of culture by highlighting the asymmetrical relation between language and culture. There is also the rejection of the idea that translation is a secondary or inferior durational and the assumption that translation can be understood only in its cultural historical context are central to contemporary translation studies. I would also like to draw your attention to descriptive translation studies, a very powerful framework developed by Gideon Terry. And, uh, what he emphasizes is that translation should be defined and read and understood from the perspective of receiving culture only. And he goes on to define translation as anything that culture calls translation. So there is no objective definition of translation, but cultural definition of translation, something that a culture defines as translation. And that would include for Terry things like pseudo translation. Pseudo translation would mean uh, the book, the SL text does not exist. It's merely fabrication. It's merely an invention. So if somebody say, for example, says that these are the poems by Scandinavian poems, poet translated into Tamil. Now you are not going to read it in Scandinavian original, uh, but those poems are actually written by the translator himself or herself. Such kind of translations are called pseudo translations and pseudo translations for Gideon Terry have an equivalent place as so called real translations. Uh, manipulation and rewriting school of translation studies is associated with Andre Lefebvre and Theo Hermans where they, they, they emphasize the role of translation, the function of translation in promoting authors fame. How, what role does translation play in uh, making the author famous? And uh, I'm reminded of very famous translations of uh, Sarat Chandra Chatterjee in Gujarati and Marathi. And people used to think that Sarat Chandra's works like Srikant or like Devdas or like Parinita are Gujarati or Marathi novels when they were actually translations, but they were so popular. And Sarat Chandra became one of the most famous authors in translation, uh, along with, say, for example, Rabindranath Tagore. So there would not be any literary history in India which would not talk of Tagore or Sarat Chandra because Sarat Chandra and Tagore exist in Gujarati, in Marathi, in Bengali, in, I'm sure in Tamil, Kannad, uh, Malayalam as well. So translations play a role in manipulation or establishing the fame of author. That is something that Lefebvre and Hermans are trying to emphasize. The policy steam theory of Itamar Evan Zohar is a very uh, sharply argued position where it sees translation as intervention into policy steam. So translation is not merely a verbal act, but it's a kind of intervention and it adds to the dynamism of a cultural policy scheme or cultural system. So it has a very powerful role to play in his approach. Itamar Ivan Zohar is associated with Tel Aviv School of Translation Studies. And many of you may be familiar with post-colonial approaches, of course. And we are actually looking at these two books from post-colonial perspective. We are looking at these two texts from post-colonial cultural studies angle. The relationship between literature and translation, literary studies and translation studies in the Western society 
was a very problematic one because translation was seen as very marginal activities and scholars like andre lefevre have argued that this is largely because of romantic notions of originality and genius of the writer and also due to platonic and christian view of translation as inferior and derivative four times removed from reality remember what plato had famously said about art that it's three times removed from in reality translation is four times removed from reality and therefore in platonic scheme of things translation would be highly inauthentic art itself is inauthentic translation would be even more inauthentic than art in christian scheme of things as we discuss the curse of babel and uh, the translation is seen as a kind of post lapsarian or post fall uh, phenomena where multiplicity of languages is seen as a problem is seen as negative thing instead of seeing as positive because you cannot uh, promote the word of god without translation and proselytization requires translation and without translation you cannot spread god's word so multiplicity of languages were seen as barriers or negative things at the same time christian view of translation is also it puts the original on pedestal it's considered as sacred text which should not be defiled which should not be contaminated and you can see how these romantic ideas of originality and genius so poets and the writers are genius while translators are laborers these kind of beliefs are deeply ingrained into western thinking about translation if you come to india and if you look at pre colonial views of translation there was no word like translation there was a word like anuvad which is not same as translation at all anuvad would more of a kind of repetition or reiteration of something uh if you look at uh, translation and original binary did not exist in india which is something that we should think about so kamban's translation of ramayana or uh, Uh, Tulsidas rewriting of uh, Ramayan are not seen as inferior activities, but they are seen as equally important or even more important activities. So this actually flies in the face of Eurocentric and nationalist view of translation that we are used to. Uh, romantic notion of originality and genius, the Platonic and Christian view of translation are deeply. Uh, Yeah, I think they deeply influence Western thinking of translation till 20th century, when people like Walter Benjamin, Jacques Derrida, and many others tried to move out of this very Eurocentric thinking about translation. Uh, and therefore, relation between translation studies and literary studies, if it is to be made more productive. Lefevre proposes that there are three distinctions that any researcher should make before researching translations. And what are those three distinctions? Lefevre's first distinction is between translating and translation. So whether translate, whether the research the researcher is studying translations as books, as products, as texts, or is translation translation being studied as an activity? needs to be first distinguished so if you are taking up a research pro project maybe mphil or phd or you are writing a re research paper on translation then you have to first clarify which is uh, which is your stand what stand you are taking are you looking at translation as a product or you are looking at translation as a process the second distinction that you have to make is between normative and evaluative approach to translation or taking translation or taking a descriptive approach to translation which means if you are looking at uh, if you are looking at gandhi's translation to, of ruskin or uh, kunte's translation of savarkar are you going to evaluate those translations are you going to judge which is better or are you going to take a descriptive approach <coughs> where you are just talking about the strategies and try to examine those strategies Uh, descriptively that's the second distinction 
and third distinction is between analysis of translation and production of translation and this is where very often indian scholars make a mess uh people have not yet grown used to the idea that translation can be studied as a product we have not yet actually adapted to this idea uh and strangely and this is my view that if you look at translation as a creative activity then we don't teach in colleges how to write poems or how to write novels but we teach students how to study novels or how to study poems but when it comes to translation we are we are so much obsessed with how to translate that we forget that you need not ask that question all the research in translation is not about Uh, about getting better at translation yourself you can study translation as an object somebody else's translations you can study gandhi's translation you can study savarkar's translation you can study all these translations without you being a translator so this distinction for me these three distinctions have to be made before you embark on a research project in translation and this is how lefevre argues that the traditional this is how you can formulate your own research uh, methodology so these three methodological distinctions for lefevre are key for having a fruitful and productive dialogue between literary studies and translation studies and looking at these three distinctions if we look at the traditional study of translation it is largely process and practice centric it is also evaluative and contemporary approach to translation is more product centric and descriptive uh, very famously uh, lefevre has gone on to define translation and rethink he rethink what we mean by translation so he goes on to argue let us accept that refractions and refraction is the term that he has made popular that is the adaptation of work of literature to different audience with the intention of influencing the way in which audience reads the work has been with us in literature throughout the history there is huge history of refraction refractions are part integral part of our culture imagine remember that how many of us have actually read mahabharata the sanskrit mahabharata but all of us know the story of mahabharata because we know it through refraction through our grandmothers through our parents through our elders teachers telling you the stories to the tv series to the comic books and so on and so forth these activities like comic books or commentaries or research papers or or uh, the oral retellings like uh, our grandmother told us uh, the stories of mahabharata or our parents did that these are forms of refractions and refractions according to lefevre are integral to culture so according to him translation should be seen as refraction then we understand the power of the text the refraction text and he says refractions are to be found in obvious form of translation but less obvious form of criticism commentary historiography plot summary and i am reminded of uh, my college days when some of the students used to read guides of uh, shakespeare without reading the shakespeare's text and that is refraction so refractions have been part of history and they influence our culture and he goes on to argue that they are extremely influential i will quickly come to comparative literature and world literature uh, world literature the idea of world literature is very old going back to goethe and marx uh goethe in his letter to one of his uh, uh younger contemporaries about idea of world literature is coming is very famous and marx idea of world literature as a kind of product of uh, global capitalism these are important theories of world literature but these are 19th century so the traditional meaning of world literature just like we made a distinction between traditional view of translation we are now looking at traditional view of world literature the traditional view of world literature 
was it it's either quantitative like all literatures in all languages of the world or it meant quant qualitative and canonical idea like masterpieces of world literature shakespeare dante vyas these are the masterpieces of world literature so that is another way of looking but people like david gamros have redefined trans, uh, world literature in uh, 1990s onwards and he sees world literature to mean all literary works that circulate beyond the culture of origin either in translation or in their original language a work only has an effective life as world literature whenever it is actively present within literary system beyond that of its original culture for example a very famous uh, uh, the tamil epic i think seel pattikaram i don't know if i got the pronunciation right was used as a metaphor and myth by arun kollatkar in his very famous marathi poems where he talks about the kannagi story uh, and uh, kovalan story in a very unique way in marathi so thus seel pattikaram becomes world literature world literature is those texts which exist in refraction in another language like marathi say for example or you may uh, the translation from uh, ak ramanujan's translation of uh, the south indian classics like kannad vachankar or uh, even tamil uh, alwars is very famous because the text moves out of its culture of origin and starts circulating beyond the confines of those culture so according to damrosh world literature is not an infinite ungraspable canon of works but rather a mode of circulation and of reading a mode that is applicable to individual works as the bodies of material available for reading the established classics and new discoveries alike you can think of certain forms like short story or the novel modern short story and modern novel are not indian products we had storytelling traditions which were very different uh, they were performative oral but the idea of modern short story as you find it in say for example anton chekhov where there is no story story is that there is no story so the modern definitions of short story or novels or even uh, literary essays or travel writing all these forms are not indian indigenous but they are world literary forms because they circulate outside their origin in fact sonnet Uh, is not english form and uh, when we talk of shakespearean sonnet and petrarchan sonnet we are talking about how italian uh, form is being indigenized nativized by shakespeare so forms can also be considered as world literature there is one dionys durian durizin who has talked about interliterary model of world literature something that i don't want to go into detail just now probably because i think we don't have sufficient time on our hands uh, do we have enough time i think i have 10 sir, minutes yeah sir you have you you can take your time sir you have 15 minutes more sir uh, or else you can take your time okay okay thank you sir. thank you uh so dionys durizin is one of the slovak scholars who has come up with interliterary models of world literature and he defines interliterary processes as as against the idea of influence studies which is a very important idea in comparative literature durizin uses interliterary processes as uh, objects of literary research uh and uh, analogy that i give to explain this idea very often is uh, say for example you are preparing tea then uh, it's a process of making tea so what i do is i take ingredients like sugar and tea leaves and milk and water and then prepare tea so in making of this product there are multiple ingredients which come from all over the world so you cannot really say that sugar has influenced tea or milk influences tea so the idea of influence is replaced by interliterary processes the processes which are not limited 
to particular nation or particular language so in order to write gujarati ghazal say for example then the form of ghazal comes from the persian arabic traditions it goes into urdu and hindustani and it goes then from hindustani and urdu into gujarati and gujarati poets very often use sanskrit meters to write ghazals in gujarati so what is happening is that the form is not influenced by somebody but it's a process in which there are multiple ingredients taken from multiple places so why do we need this kind of idea is because we are obsessed with the ideas of influence and what happens in influence very often is that we consider the influencer to be superior culturally superior to uh, the influence the recipient culture so in order to overcome this kind of hierarchic binary durism has proposed this interliterary process the idea of interliterary process and then he goes on to talk about interliterary idea of world literature where world literature is not an object but a kind of uh, a dynamic construct which changes with time another modern contemporary notion of world literature comes from digital humanities and that idea is of distant reading franco moretti a very famous theorist has argued that literature around us is now unmistakably a planetary history that it is one and unequal with a core and periphery the question moretti argues is not what we should do the question is how the question is how should we study it what do we mean by core and periphery for example uh, we know so many english authors but how many english people know tamil authors for example how many students in uh, london would know about contemporary tamil writers for example which we don't know that that is what moretti means by one and unequal that means we are at the peripheries of a world system so moretti argues that we should now develop different methods for studying world literature which is a planetary unequal system made of core and periphery and he believes that to in order to read the system that is planetary and the archive that is almost infinite close reading is not going to help because close reading would involve a very small sample size and and uh, data set for example if you are talking about uh, and that's what we do in our colleges typically after reading three plays by shakespeare we start commenting on elizabethan cultural history when there were thousands of books written at the time of shakespeare but we select only three and then draw conclusion so close reading very often relies on a very small sample size and that's a methodological problem according to moretti and therefore he goes on to talk about something called distant reading where thousands of books that are written are digitized and you develop computing technology to read this massive big data of text and he he calls this method as distant reading now i am not going to discuss this distant reading uh, right now at length because my focus is more on translation studies but i'm just pointing out the recent development in translation studies because it's my argument that the recent development in translation studies have uh, almost laid the foundation to the modern notion of world literature that's my argument damrosh gives three fold definition of world literature the first is world literature is an elliptical refraction of national literature what do you mean by elliptical refraction for example a performance of mahabharat by peter brooks in london is an elliptical refraction of uh, indian text in western society so that is what world literature means second definition is world literature is writing that gains in translation and that's a very powerful definition of world literature sarvodaya is not when we study compare sarvodaya with unto this last our question should not be what is lost in translation but what is gained in translation and what we have gained is nothing less than the great political ideology for freedom struggle nothing less than that 
world literature is not a set of texts but a mode of reading a form of detached arguments now if you see then uh, the, these definitions of world literature you can see that all of these definitions are deeply connected to the notion of translation more recently damrosh has compared two perspectives on world literature one as world literature as a vast landscape and expansion of planetary system or you study world literature within national context that means you study how shakespeare is received in uh, tamil how uh, what is the role played by shakespeare in development of modern tamil theater these are the questions that we we ask in world literature and uh, world literature is not like an infinite outside but something that is within our national traditions these are some of the important contemporary formulations of world literature and my argument is that all of these and coming to the end of my presentation all of these are based on the definition of translation and this definition of translation is the expanded definition of translation not a very restrictive way of looking at translation as a verbal uh, equivalent search for verbal equivalent it's not that restrictive notion of translation but an expanded notion of translation and i'm sure uh, you must have heard of the famous tripartite division given by jacobson of uh, translation as interliterary intraliterary and intersemiotic where intersemiotic translation is nothing less than moving away from the me one media into another so such broad definition of translations uh, have helped or have are been at the heart of the notion of world literature and that is why recent critics of world literature like emily actor has taken uh, had has focused on translation in her attack on the whole idea of world literature so emily actor in her very famous book called against world literature on the politics of untranslatability offers a critique of various models of world literature by arguing that these notions rely on translatability assumption and consequently incommensurability and untranslatable are insufficiently built into the literary heuristic what she means is that there are so many things which are untranslatable but they are not taken on board while we theorize world literature that is her complaint she questions the tendencies in world literature towards reflective endorsement of cultural equivalence and substitutability as well as celebration of nas nationalistic and ethnically branded differences so world literature and translation studies work with the assumption that translation is a good thing as a critical practice enabling com communication across languages and the right to untranslatable according to actor was blind sided so you can see that one of the most uh, serious critiques of the idea of world literature has focused on the question of the underlying assumption of translatability because unless you accept that trans possibility of translation you cannot think of world literature so uh, world literature the idea of world literature and that's the argument that i have made is based on the translatability assumptions of course i don't agree with actor because problem is that once you accept once you start looking at untranslatable then you are not able to speak of it in any way and it ends up being something like sapir whorf thesis the very famous sapir whorf argument which roman jacobson is critiquing in his very famous essay that you i'm sure you must have discussed the tripartite division of translation uh where he talks about translation in semiotic sense rather than in verbal sense and he goes on to argue that everything is possible in translation except literature you can translate everything except literature so jacobson's a very famous critique of uh sapir whorf thesis is something that emily actor should look at very seriously because i think that is where it uh, creates problem and david damrosh has pointed out that actor says she is against world literature but she doesn't say what is she for so it's easy to uh, say that i'm against abc but it's very difficult to posit yourself that i am for 
FG8. So uh, these are my views on translation. And to sum up whatever I have been saying is that the conventional thinking about translation is inadequate and uh, almost irrelevant when we look at some of the most important translations in our first languages. So I, one of the assignments that I have given you is to uh, look at which are two most important translations in your first language or in your mother tongue and try to figure out why are they so important. Uh, so once we start asking ourselves, why are these two translations so important? Say, for example, Bible in Tamil. Say, for example, Kalib in Tamil or whatever, or Ambedkar in Tamil. Uh, you ask yourself, why are these translations so important? Then the questions of whether they are good translations or bad translations or whether their spirit comes through or whether it is literal or faithful are irrelevant questions. We are interested in the cultural historical context in which those translations came up. And what we also ask more interesting questions of the politics of translation and uh, the influence of this translation. Incidentally, I have heard that Savarkar's book that I just mentioned, one of the book that he translated from English into Marathi was a book called Autobiography of Joseph Uespe Mazzini and Mazzini was a very famous Italian freedom uh, Italian nationalist and this book was banned by British uh, government and uh, and that's why people memorize Maharashtians memorize the preface of that book and when British discovered that and they they also made it a point that anybody arrested with that book and this is I have heard, I don't know for sure, that that person's tongue will be cut off. That was the punishment given if you are found with translation. So I'm sure translation has got great cultural significance and the conventional views of translation won't help us to unread, uncover these uh, important cultural significances. So this is where I want to stop and I want to thank Dr. Maithili for having me on this very important translation workshop and uh, having me share my views, my research on translation. So I would like to express my gratitude also to all the listeners who have so uh, 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 patiently been listening to my conversation. So thank you, Dr. Maithili. Hope I am on time. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, shall we take one or two questions uh, in the discussion session? Yeah, please. Please, yeah. Sir, please. Uh, participants, if you have any questions, kindly put it in the chat box and it will be addressed. Participants, uh, we can thank each other later, and uh, we would like—I would like you to make use of such a versatile personality to clear our doubts regarding translation and get a spark from him. Yeah, there is a very interesting question by T. Ajit Kumar asking, "What is your comment on poor translation?" All right, and I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, now, uh, how do you discover a that a particular translation is good and one or bad? One way of discovering is you know the original language. You discover that this poem is badly translated from Tamil because you know Tamil. However, most of the translations are not meant for people who know the first language. So judgments very often come from those bilinguals for whom those texts is not meant. Besides, what is good, what is bad uh, becomes irrelevant as in the questions like Sarvodaya, for example, the text that I'm discussing. Does this question help us to understand the cultural significance of translation is my counter question. Now, Sarvodaya may be a bad translation and in my view, it's profoundly transfer, transformative translation that Gandhi has done. Sarvoda is a term that you find in Sanskrit. From, he has coined from Sanskrit and uh, it is deeply imbibed in Indian metaphysical traditions, the idea of Sarvoda. 
while unto this last comes from deeply from christian metaphysical uh, uh, theological frameworks so is it a good translation or bad translation the whole question of judging a translation is a very problematic inquiry and very often it takes us it makes us ask irrelevant questions is the translation of uh, savarkar's text good or bad becomes needless what we know is that ras bihari bose and subhash chandra bose trans translated published the english translation of uh, those books so for me these questions are not very important to understand or unpack the cultural significance of translation or the ideological impact of the translation so i hope i i, I uh, i'm able to put forth my i have responded if we get trapped in good bad trap then we it, we are we enter into very subjective domain i may like that particular film and you may not like that particular film so uh, that film is good for me and that film is not good for me so uh, judging is not always very interesting way to unpack the cultural and historical significance of literary text or translation that's my view okay uh, there is i think a question about pseudo pseudo translation from raj lakshmi pseudo translations as i have said is important part of gidden terry's descriptive translation studies where he says that translations are defined by receiving cultures uh, so so say for example <coughs> i for always keep forgetting the name of a british poet who became very famous by saying that these are scottish ballads but they were not scottish ballads they were his own words so these are pseudo translation translations where the source text does not exist are called pseudo translation now you may dismiss them as useless but for gidden terry and descriptive translation studies these are very as important as other translations so i request you to look up gidden terry's uh, books that is towards descriptive translation studies okay Uh, what are the other questions i uh, i think uh, dr veena singh talks about politics of translation then my entire uh, lecture is about politics of translation if you so uh, translation is always political and when we say always political uh, i don't define politics in terms of party politics like bjp versus congress i'm not looking at politics i'm i am talking about politics in political science view of politics politics as involving conflicts and attempt to resolve conflicts that that is how uh, uh, political science defines politics so uh, if you expand or if you take more scientific understanding of the term politics then you can understand how translation is political at all times right so we are looking at politics from a very expanded and more conceptual definition of political rather than merely talking about politics as party politics i am not talking about ai dmk versus dmk i am talking about politics as what are the ideological moves that translation is making or how it's trying to influence a culture what are the things that it's not saying and so on and so forth uh there is a question by kamla devi where she talks about translation does multilateral diplomacy in the field of cultural and the political well diplomacy is part of politics international politics so you can say that translation does play a role in part of diplomacy for example if two countries want to improve their relations say for example we are talking of post corona covid situation and you want to improve your relation with china then one thing that you can think of is to translate more literature from chinese into our own first languages and uh, we can also expect chinese to translate more from our literature so translation does play diplomacy does play an important uh, diplomacy can become an important uh, aspect of translation 
there is another question here from Savya Sachi, who says that do you think the refraction in one language part of uh, WL, how are they valued in literature? Well, uh, in our literary studies, we don't take uh, uh, refractions very seriously. For example, how many of us uh, consider comic books based on Ramayana as serious literature? But our understanding of Ramayana has come from TV series and comic books. So these multiple uh, rewritings or retellings of the text are very important part of our culture. And uh, as student of literature, we should be engaging with them on very serious, uh, very seriously. For example, many of us have watched Harry Potter rather than read it. There is one question. Uh, translation of comics like Tintin by SB says this question by SB says translation of comics. Uh, Tintin or Asterix into how to translate Belgium or Gaelic influences. Now, how to translate question comes from where, why should you translate? What is your intention behind translating? What is the scopus, as they say, behind translating will influence how to translate. So if your translation wants to bring out cultural histories and differences, then you will translate more of Bel Belgian and Gaelic influences through paratext, like footnotes, like uh, glossary, like prefaces and suffixes. Or you may try to incorporate certain terms from Belgian culture through circumlocutions. Right. So these are certain strategies that you would develop if, if at all you want to <coughs> retain cultural uh, differences. But if you don't want to do it, then you can bring in a lot of creative elements on you, from your own culture. So how you translate depends on why you are translating. So your intention and scopus of translation decides its strategy. There is a question from Anshuman Pradhan. Can folk literature of world literature, one language, achieve the tag of world literature if it gets famous? Definitely. Definitely. Think of Panchatantra and stories from Panchatantra going into uh, Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. Or look at Aesop's fables and you'll find a lot of things which have come from uh, Indian uh, folk tales. So folk tales have a way of traveling, and that is what Damarosh says, that uh, world literature is a mode of circulation. So if uh, folk literature travels outside its cultural frames uh, or boundaries, it becomes world literature. OK, what is the advice to new translators to overcome difficulties in translation? That's, I think, one question. Uh, where is it? Uh, okay. uh, uh, before that, I think S. Eunice Catherine has said the translation is like woman. If she's beautiful, she's not faithful. Or if she's, she uh, wants to take my opinion and my opinion is what I have given. The, this is a very conventional way of understanding translation. Not just that, it's also sexist. Right. Uh, it's of no use to me to point out that Gandhi's translation is not faithful to Ruskin. So it's not beautiful or whatever. This kind of questions for me are irrelevant in analysis of or if you're trying to unpack and uncover cultural significance of translation. Right. That's my view. So I'm just reiterating my view. Here. There is Srikant Ramesh Chandra who says that can you shed light on translation with reference to Marquez and his imaginary and translation of Narayan Malgudi days growing as village as world changes? I didn't get the question. I didn't get the question. I am, of course, familiar with both the texts, but I don't get the question that you are asking. Anyway, uh, Gayatri M asked me in your presentation, you have mentioned that translation is influenced by dominant ideologies. Yeah, dominant ideologies of translating cultures, receiving culture. That's what I meant. So when Gandhi is translating unto this last, he is influenced by the politics of the period. 
and that is nationalist politics of the period so that is how it affects this choice of the text so even choice of the text is never neutral it's always driven by certain ideological and cultural projects translation becomes popular than original i feel okay sir could you relate literature and translation how are they related well uh, how are they related uh, i don't in terms of literary and translation i don't create a binary between creative and uh, original and translation bible that you read is what original or translation it's it's literature ramayan that you read in tamil is what original or literal translation it is both so i don't make a kind of uh, uh, rig rigorous watertight compartmentalization between translation and literature because all original has an impact of some other text at the same time all translation involve creativity there is one question which says is there impact of psychology behind translation what do you think of feminism in translation uh, psychology involves <coughs> uh, human mind the whole theory of behavior so uh, if you look at translation process then lot of it happens within translator's mind which is thought to be as a kind of black box you cannot open it and see what's going on in translate there's mind to analyze the process of translation though many people have tried to define it you see that there is some domain which is a gray area where we cannot make out what is happening in the process of translation and roman jacobson probably very famously said that translation is one of the most mysterious things in the history of the world and i i, I don't quote him uh, literally but uh, uh coming to feminism and translation thank you for this question uh feminists have engaged with the question of translation very seriously and one of the earliest statements are by people like uh, gayatri spivak by also by uh, lori chamberlain and lori chamberlain has very famously argued and this is what brings us to the earlier question about translation and uh, women uh, pretty, beautiful and faithful thing so they have interrogated these kind of metaphors and they have tried to figure out why do people think of translation in this sexist ways why is translation so gendered and lori chamberlain looks at the entire history of translation theory where thinking about original and translation translator and the writer have been in gendered terms so i i request you to look up lori chamberlain and cherry stoney and gatu steve actually have theorized translation from a uh, feminist perspective reshma jogi says if translation creates a negative ideology or impact on society what would you call it good and bad again the question of good and bad i think are not very interesting questions personally uh think of main camp a uh, very famous autobiography by hitler do you think it's beneficial to society it's frankly but i am not interested in whether that is a uh, uh, good or bad i am interested in the ideological moves the impact that such books have on our society so instead of asking whether it's good or bad it's more interesting to ask whether these translations how have these translations in, impacted society so i prefer not to judge translations i am more interested to uncover their cultural significance because judging translation is usually a waste of time as a translator i feel that i am a, uh, my poem is the best but then somebody may come up with another better poem so my view on this judgment business is that if you think you can translate it better than me do it yourself so i have translated a lot and uh, uh, if people feel that uh, i have not done a good job i tell them that you do it yourself that's the only response i give to this whole judging business but as a researcher and student of translate uh, translation my question is 
how do you unpack its cultural significance that is more interesting than judging Yes, sir. sir it's so kind of you to take up to many questions and just enlarge our vision on translation sir so we come to the end of the discussion session and uh, uh, before we come to the end i think those people whose questions i have not addressed can yes, email sir. me their questions i think yes, then i will uh, uh, respond because i don't want to leave them uh, Unaddressed, so sure. you can email me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for your kind gesture, sir. And uh, your presentation was such a mind-blowing one, sir. You took us uh, a trip from old literature through comparative literature and landed us in the world literature. Uh, you have taken up examples from the translation world and explained the process of translation, which uh, was highly motivating to us. and your presentation vividly explains your vast exposure to the literary field and translation and you have opened up new avenues uh, like digital humanities distant reading elliptical refraction etc sir and you have paved way for us with strategies to approach world literature and combine it with translation all of us were really spellbound sir thank you so much for being with us today and helping us to enrich our knowledge on translation sir thank you so much sir so it's my pleasure and i want to thank all of you for having me listening to me and dr maithili in particular for having me abroad in this very fascinating workshop that you have organized so i wish all the best to all of you yes sir thank you so much sir uh, participants uh, we just move on to uh our just next five minute session to open up with your feedback regarding the workshop uh, we can take up uh, two to three participants expressing your views regarding the workshop so i request the participants to unmute yourself and give us your feedback about the session and then i'll continue to the instructions Hello. Yes, ma'am. Shanti, ma'am. Hello. I'm Dr. Yes, Shanti from Goa. Yeah. Ma'am, please continue. Ma'am, you're you audible. Yeah, you are you audible, ma'am. Yes. Uh, it was very, it was very interesting and uh, informative. Say, it's not translation, but uh, I uh, do on Commonwealth literature and. Uh, comparative studies and uh, um american literature but uh, this uh, was an eye opener for me because i uh, never uh, uh, i might have uh, read the translation works but after attending this workshop it was i am going to do uh, my research at least one or two papers i would like to publish and uh, the credit goes entirely to this workshop and to you uh, ma'am maithili because you have done an excellent job and the resource persons whom you have selected were very nice and uh, hats off to you thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much for your encouraging words shall i we can have yes sir shall i i am sri prasad thank you ma'am for yes. giving me a chance like this i think this was a uh, really awesome for yes, yes, seven days ah. we have been having ट्रांसलेशम ट as john dunn rightly says no man is an island no text is an island in itself it is also a part of the continent i congratulate maithili ma'am for organizing such a wonderful uh what is a sessions for the past 7 days and the resource persons you have selected i should make my point that they are all diverse and they have making us or taking us from journey to adventure to inspiration and to various 
arise of translation i hope all the participants in this particular program have been benefited by this extend my sincere gratitude to the organizers and sometimes you were uh, you were showing your managerial skills as the lieutenant and that is also fine i i i'm i really cherish to be a part of this seminar thank you very much for the same thank you sir thank you so much for your valuable comment hello ma'am yes ma'am hello hello good morning ma'am yes ma'am yeah your audio uh, you can proceed yeah i would like to congratulate you ma'am for having arranged this wonderful uh, webinar it was very interesting very fruitful and all the sessions were very 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 good and uh, in fact i am handling a translation uh, paper for the pg students when i uh, went through this uh, webinar only i came to understand how this can be taught in a very effective manner and all the sessions were very very interesting and it uh, gave an eye opener for every one of us and uh, the theories which were very very difficult to handle in the class was very simplified by the resource person hats off you hats off to you ma'am for giving a wonderful opportunity to have such resource persons thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you very much uh, i could uh, feel uh, vincent soundran sir is still in the uh, meeting uh, he is a versatile personality and a translator uh, from madurai uh i i am a ardent fan of him so we hear a word from you and any other participants to give feedback yes ma'am ma'am uh, hello ma'am proceed hello hello can i talk to yes sir hello yeah madam i am dr sai dali bodisha yes sir uh, i sincerely thank the organizers ma'am very rarely we get lectures webinars on a translation studies and on the practical aspects of translation thank you so much for organizing such a seven day international web workshop you all enjoyed it really we got a lot of insights it was very very useful particularly the writer translator and today's session was very very useful we got a lot of uh, insights and it was an all inclusive session today so we sincerely on behalf of all the participants i sincerely sincerely thank the organizers thank you so much friends looking forward to a program like this in the near future thank you sure yeah, sir participants Hello. thank you all for your valuable suggestions yes ruby ma'am ma'am uh, actually uh, i have been translating lot of uh, uh, short stories and other things uh, yes, but uh, this one uh, today the sir's uh, uh, session i got an idea of uh, translating pseudo translation so i used to write some poems i can translate my own poems into uh, english or in other languages so some uh, uh, useful ideas i got from this Uh, for the past uh, 15 years uh, i have been in this field of translation uh, then yes, i thought um, only theories can be uh, be very much useful in tra tra translation but now i have got an idea that even by practice we can improve more and we can get more ideas and we can implement more solution to the translation yes, so yes, so much of thanks ma'am uh, for giving such an opportunity to attend this uh, workshop thanks a lot thank you ma'am thank you very much participants we close the feedback session from the participant side thank you all for your encouraging words and now it's time for me uh, from the convener's desk uh, to give a note of thanks to all the good hearts who have made this possible uh, so uh, starting from my family vasavi throughout the journey the encouraging words from my principal dr anjay kumar secretary mr s dayanan president and sudhakar former secretaries mr b adi keshavan and mr hima mrs hima vati sadasivam and director professor v sivakumar they channelize me throughout the journey words are containers of power I use them to support and inspire as saying goes and this is what the above mentioned personalities have done it for me 
Uh, my gratitude are due to my well wishers, former principal, uh, Dr. N. Jai Shankar sir, who guided me with his comments on daily basis after the session and charging me with his positivity. And also former principal and head of the English department, Mr. E. Aguilan sir, for guiding me on language aspects. And uh, it would be incomplete if I don't thank my Vasavians teaching staff members, in particular, my friends who motivated me through their encouraging words and messages. Though apart by distance due to COVID-19, they made me felt close to heart with their encouraging words. I would also like to thank my college non-teaching staff members, Office Supernan Ms. Namagiri Ma'am and Typist Mrs. Bhuvaneshwari for their support in making ready the official communications to send to the speakers. I truly feel that words wouldn't be sufficient to thank all the keynote speakers starting from day one to day seven for devoting their time to educate the participants on translation platform. Yes, my dear participant, the greatest gift you can ever give to others is your time because you can never regain it in your lifetime. And they have done it for us. Everyone were unique on their aspects of translation and delivered knowledge packed session. I thank Dr. Mahendra Manyam from Malaysia. Dr. R. Dharani from Tirpur, Dr. Shanti Chitra from Chennai, Dr. S. Uma Shankar from Sri Lanka, Dr. M. S. Sushila from Madurai, Dr. Sachin C. Ketkar from Gujarat for readily accepting my invitation to be the keynote speaker and who were the reason behind the successful completion of this workshop. I'm, uh, I'm not sharing this as a formality note, my dear participant. It is that just I want to underline. A journey of thousand miles begin with a single step. Once you decide to do something, come out of the fear and start executing. Your one step will lead you with ways to find all the other avenues as I have reached here to this destination of hosting the International Web Workshop. I, I, I'm not well versed in technology, but I took the help of my well-wisher and even to reach out the uh, speakers outside India, uh, I got the help of my friends from uh, Pamatur and I was put up to the next step automatically. So always remember, if it was easy, then everyone will be doing it. So never be in fear of doing something which is not easy. Come out of your comfort zone. Take your turn to prove yourself. Of course, difficulties will arise like the technological constraints that we encountered uh, now and then. And even, you know, a participant has sent me a message that uh, he will file a case against me as I denied him from entering the Google Classroom. And sometimes you feel people around you do not support you and your domestic atmosphere sometimes turns out to be obstacle. But we have to overcome everything. Give us a push and Come out of these comfort zone and create histories. But remember, Henry David Torio says, success usually comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. So let us get connected with this literature platform. And uh, I hope this uh, uh, workshop has just thrown a stone in your thinking and uh, it will create the ripples. Can we will just get connected to the ripples that has uh, created within us and let us all be uh, bring ourselves out as a translator or a researcher in translation arena. So uh, Martin Luther King even says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't walk, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But by all means, keep moving. And uh, I'm, I'm surely uh, failing in my duty if I don't recognize the kind of cooperation that I receive from the participants. Every resource person gave me a comment that they have attended two or three webinars earlier. And this was the one where the participants behaved in a well-mannered way. Though uh, I was uh, labeled as I was a little bit harsh with my words when I was passing initial instructions to the participants through WhatsApp group. Um, but still, uh, the, the control that we had 
in that group made us this platform as a learner platform so thank you all the participants for your extreme cooperation to bring about this workshop successfully in a grand way and some of our participants even called me and asked to guide how to make a google meet and host a webinar and they convinced me that they got a inspiration from this platform uh, which i feel it gives a high order of self satisfaction to me and uh, this is the first step my dear participants let's go ahead and achieve success uh, as a convener i would like to just register the uh, statistical data regarding this uh, Uh, international uh, web workshop the total registrations that i received were 704 from four different countries uh, outside india and from 18 countries uh, 18 states in india and the number of uh, participants from other country were 10 and participants from other states of india were 152 and tamil nadu registration uh, participants were 558 and happy to share that throughout the seven day sessions we were able to cater to the need of 250 participants online effectively and 325 participants offline through youtube links our google meet platform is consequently filled with complete strength of 250 participants throughout the journey of seven days it gives me immense pleasure in hosting this um, a uh, workshop and i thank each and every one who helped in a little way or the other to bring out this workshop in a successful way so i just want to uh, end up with the lines of robert frost from the road not taken i shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence two roads diverged in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference right so uh, i hope uh, we had given you a very good platform to make yourself uh, exposure to the translation field and i also want to quote the lines of bharati teedi choru dinan tindru pala chinnan chiru kadaigal pesi manam vaadi thunvam miga ulanju pirar vaada pala cheyalgal seidu narai koodi kila parvu meidi kodum koottrukku irayana pin maayum pala vedikai manidarai pol naan veelven endru ninaithaayo yes my dear participants we are so special we are so unique each one of us or or just embedded with too much of unique qualities let us focus on that and get success and be happy throughout our life thank you for giving me a golden opportunity to address you thank you all right uh, uh, participants i have a little uh, inst instructions to be given to you regarding your certificates uh, uh, once you submit today's feedback by tomorrow morning 9 o'clock and then i am going to circulate a collection of particulars from you for the certificate purpose uh, once you fill up these two uh, forms and submit it after that we will process the uh, certificate uh, writing process and then we will send you the certificates through your email i request you to stay in the whatsapp group that is created for this purpose because the further instructions are to be given in that whatsapp group only and you will be receiving your certificates uh, by monday or tuesday uh, so if you don't get your certificate by tuesday night 9 o'clock and then you can call me up regarding certificates so this is what from the convener side to uh, tell you to the participants Uh, thank you all thank you very much for staying with us and making the seven days a uh, sweet memory to carry till the life end so we can sign off from the meeting uh, we'll meet you on a different platform again thank you all thank you ma'am thank you sir